No, you're I'm in the picture. Yeah, I'm in the picture. Of the I see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's hiding behind the screen. I like it. No attention. We are live now. See that. To check it really quick to make sure. Okay, we are on. I think we're live. I'm pretty sure that we are live now, <laughs> as far as I can tell from the checking. Yeah, that's but I just want you see it. Yeah, great. So welcome everybody who has joined us for our live conversation with Susan Thomas, Bev beck and Ellen Ornitz for the discussion of their exhibition, Convergence. Um, so welcome everybody. You can just wave and say hi to everyone on hand. <laughs> hi. hi everybody. <laughs> we are so glad that you're joining us on this beautiful day. I don't know what it's like at your house, but here in Great Falls, Montana, we have a sunny day and uh, looking forward to the spring to come. And I think it's an excellent time to discuss convergence because it is about um, rebirth. It is about life and it is about um, women coming together um, to discuss similarities in their work that um, that give reference to the, the world that we live in and the earth that we, we thrive off of. Um, so this spring, here we are springing into action with, um, with convergence. So thank you again for joining. Feel free to write anything in the comment area. We'll get back to you with statements afterwards. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and screen share now so we can take a little bit of time to walk through the exhibition. Each one of our featured artists is going to have an opportunity to discuss and share about their work um, and uh, their experience. And in this way, we're all going to speak together for an interesting conversation that is uh, relaxed and enjoyable and um, going to be a good time. So thank you so much for being here. Just give me one second. She has to go back to the first one. The first slide. You guys see it? Go all the way back, but it's refusing, so I will have to manage it. <laughs> we don't have control sometimes. Welcome again, everyone. And thank you to all of our sponsors. Thank you to all the sponsors um, who make all the exhibitions and programming and education possible here at Paris Gibson Square Museum of Art. Without your sponsorship, we wouldn't be able to bring such wonderful artists to our community to share their work and to um, help us engage in critical and artistic ways. Here's a little bit of a close up for those of you who can't see us in the small screenshots to the right of the picture plane. But here we have our wonderful Bev Beck Glucker coming to us from Missoula, and we have Ellen Ornitz, who is um, quite the experienced curator herself, having been um, the curator at the Emerson for over 20 years, correct? How long? Ellen? I was a volunteer for right. a few, and then I did another 16. So you lost, lost track. track. You lost track. <laughs> and Susan Thomas. Um, who has, was actually the education curator at Paris Gibson Square Museum of Art for many years, 
All three of these women play very important roles in the um, art world here in Montana. They are educators, they are artists, they are curators, um, and they are key figures um, in the artist movement um, in the Northwest, I would say, and have exhibited across the United States as well. So thank you all for joining us and taking the time to share your work with everyone via Facebook. For those of you who haven't been able to make it to the museum quite yet, um, here is a panoramic view of our Rothschiller Gallery where we have the convergence of the works together on exhibit within the space. I think it's an excellent perspective of what it feels like when you walk in the space to experience the air and the earth moving together in time. Oh. Feel free to chime in, ladies. I think one of the things that we were just <laughs> talking about before we started um, is uh, the shadowing, um, it, adding an entirely, uh, a whole new element um, and a whole new layer into the entirety of the exhibition. The shadows are on the floor and the walls are just gorgeous. And you know what I was thinking about the reflexiveness of the wooden floor kind of bringing in the idea of the liquid of oh, water, yeah. you know? So we're just tying all of these elements together. And um, honestly, it's quite a beautiful space. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm not being egotistical in saying that <laughs> because I think I will say that from the visitors that we've had, um, it's been a, a meditative space, quite enjoyable, you know, and I'm, I'm looking forward to those of you who are watching us here coming to see the space for yourself. And I think you will agree. We're gonna move ahead because we have so much to talk about and so much to see and so little time to do it. Um, so we wanna go ahead and, and give you a few images of what the space looks like. And we're gonna go ahead and begin our discussion with Bev. Hello, Bev. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Do you want to go ahead, Bev, and, and tell everybody a little bit about yourself? And um, Yeah, and first of all, I just want to thank you, Nicole, for all of your work, and uh, to thank The Square for having us. Um, the idea for the three of us to uh, exhibit together um, came about a few years ago, and so it's kind of finally coming to fruition. But I think just, uh, you know, realizing some of the similarities um, in our work in terms of um, our influences, you know, from the natural world and some of our interests in uh, the natural environment and just our sort of aesthetic sensibility, we really felt like uh, our work together um, could make for a really nice exhibition. And wow, we're really pleased with uh, how the whole thing came together. And I guess uh, something that should be said is that we, none of the three of us uh, had uh, been looking at or had been shown uh, all of the images that we were all working with. And it just, uh, I think just knowing each other and knowing our work for the past number of years, um, we just trusted that it, it was gonna happen and it did so <laughs> it's really nice yeah and I think that was going on what we were talking about briefly or I was saying was like this coming together of minds right oh yeah Where you might have been working separately and doing what is um, um, most common for yourself and and but when you came together and congregated, you just created this exhibition just because you all knew each other's work so well and knew that it would work together. Yeah, I think that's really true. We had the confidence um, in regard to that. And you touched on some of the themes that kind of run through the entirety of the exhibition, Nicole. Um, and Susan and Ellen jump in here, but um, I like how you related this exhibition to the timing right now, spring and uh, renewal and rebirth. Um, certainly 
there are, uh, you know, there certainly is that aspect within the exhibition. And, um, you know, I think just, uh, you talked about uh, transformation and the passage of time in, uh, in, in the brochure. And I think just, it's very evident, um, you know, as one goes through the exhibition that we're dealing a lot with um, just the passage of time as we move through this earth and the experiences uh, that each of us has. And we're all making this journey. We're all on this earth while we're doing our journey and uh, how we uh, experience that. I mean, it's a little, it's different for each of us, but I think that each of the three of us are definitely making statements about um, our place in the world and, and how we view uh, uh, the evolution of what's happening around us and how we view the natural environment. That is true. And I think when we look at this pollinators 13B, that is an excellent example of the way in which you're uh, interrogating this transformation or the way you, we all exist within this world and the other animals and plants and the environment around us and how we interact and relate to one another and our dependency on one another, right? So this idea and the bee, of course, being one of those life-giving animals that we take for granted. Yeah, um, definitely, uh, Nicole. And um, <clears throat> I might add I, that I kind of started this in whole pollinator series in, I'm gonna say 2015 or 2016. And I first worked with the whole topic uh, in Great Falls for the, uh, the Urban Art Project. And <clears throat> then I just kind of continued to make pieces. Uh, and I'm, I always think that people just must not realize that over one third of the food that we eat requires pollination by insects, particularly bees. And then just the rapid decline of our honeybee population and the rapid decline of pollinators due to you know, all of the things happening in the world and habitat loss and chemicals and everything that's harming uh, those populations. And so they're just things that I want to bring an awareness to because they're really important issues for me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's those are interesting points, especially based on the way that you work and create your pieces. Because I think there's definitely a tie in there, like I had mentioned, where um, these animals that are so essential to our lives um, are kind of, there's just been a, a persistence in trying to find ways to keep them alive and to not make them disappear from our lives forever. And the way that I see your mixed media pieces where you're working the position of the bee and that you can rework them or move the, the different um, print around, to me is like that search, like I had said to you earlier, like yeah. that search for finding the best way to keep them here, the search to find the best way to communicate to others to make the bee obvious and say, why the bee? What is the bee? If I put the bee here, if I put this image here, if I move it around here, if I compositionally organize it with this other structure, how can I bring the bee into the common mind? I mean, that's how I see it sometimes in terms of that problem solving that you were talking about. Yeah, definitely. And then there's the challenge to the viewer. You know, I mean, here's this topic, here's this whole topic of pollinators and uh, my whole disappearance series, you know, dealing with the disappearance of the pollinators. And then what is the viewer to do with that? So I, I, I am, uh, you know, striving to present that challenge to the viewer because, and each of us has a role to play. You know, I wanted to jump in for a second and, and mention that when I travel, I travel to a lot of urban areas and go to museums and often the artists are talking about urban topics. Of course they are because that's their life. 
And it seems like the different, I mean, that's getting to be more and more predominant when you see art is, is urban issues. And so what's kind of interesting here is that all three of us still really are enamored of the object. We're mm -hmm. not just making digital art, we're, we like the physicality. And we also are, are all three of us really connected to nature, right? It sounds really corny, but it's really, um, it's not as common as it used to be. It used to be artists were always working off of nature, but now it seems like it's this uh, special thing. So anyway, just a thought. Ellen, that's good. And we've talked about that before. You know, part of it is, you know, the age that we all are. And I think I was saying this a few years ago when we had that show in Helena, and I was just talking about this feeling of, um, of uh, urgency or something like, so we have to get this work done or make these certain pots or get, you know, because just what's happening um, in our natural world and just what's happening in our world in general, it, I always feel this kind of sense of, I need to hurry and make this work or to preserve um, these ideas because the, because the world is changing so fast. Yeah. I've thought about how, um, as you've mentioned, age, uh, certainly my early childhood was spent outdoors. And I'm, I'm not sure that a lot of children get to do that as much now. And how much was imprinted on me. I mean, I remember how things felt how leaves felt or smelled or looked or shells. Um, it was imprinted so early um, and I, it's never left me. <laughs> and I think I switched it to this sl slide because I think that way the viewer can see how that uh, what you were all discussing is, is seen in the work that was created, you know, this kind of, um, materiality that relates to um, holding on to the earth in mm -hmm. yeah. either by what's pictured or what it's made out of or how it's made and um, that overarching concern. Here we see that same piece, Bev, on the entry wall here with two more pieces that relate to the pollinator series. Let me know if I'm talking too low. I have a tendency to do that. I'll just start yelling, that might help. <laughs> <laughs> and this is quite an interesting piece that I think has a visual impact um, that brings to mind many different things for me, you know in relation to what you were just discussing about our, our you know, inter, um, you know, our coexistence with these animals and how we're not so far off from them. And our life is just as important as theirs and means about the same, right? <laughs> yeah, and you know, in this piece, I mean, it's called life dot dot journey because it, because that's, I, I'm talking about just, you know, our own life journey. And for years and years, I've been pretty preoccupied with issues of mortality in my work. And uh, so the turkey vulture, <laughs> as everybody knows, um, it's a scavenger and it lives on, on carrion, on carcasses. And so it's that whole regeneration again of, um, the living consuming the dead and the cycle, you know, continuing. And uh, I'm just uh, quite intrigued with the turkey vulture, you know, as, as you know, just the species that it is. Um, and also uh, talking about the urban art project a couple of years ago, Bobby Tilton and I, um, we created an installation for the UAP in Great Falls uh, dealing with uh, heavily uh, heavily utilizing turkey vultures in our messages about mortality. Bobby had just lost her husband. I had lost my sister. And so 
uh, it, it's an image that's kind of dear <laughs> to our hearts. Um, so yeah, and then I kind of started working on these uh, horizontally formatted pieces about five years ago. Um, and for me, they were kind of these, uh, it was kind of like a triptych in a way so that I could uh, figure out these different sections of it. And I've really had a lot of fun working within that format. Um, and uh, as you can see, you know, these are all mixed media pieces. So there might be, um, you know, like relief print, monotype, there's intaglio sections in the middle, um, transparencies that are overprinted. So there's just all kinds of stuff in these. And that's kind of the value of being able to actually go in person to see the exhibition because there's just uh, so much layering and so many different processes um, with all of our work. Uh, being able to view them up close is, is <laughs> really nice. I think there's this element in what you were saying and discussing the pieces, this, this element of fearlessness, you know, you're saying life and journey. I think the way that you are so comfortable with your mix, the mixed media that you use, that you have no fear of intermixing things, of layering, you know, but at the same time, it's very organized. You know, it's categorical. There's like a documentation type of process going on. So, you know, I, I, I find it an interesting mix of just being free to explore yet at the same time being sure to, um, to make it very clear and, and, and orderly in some way so that the idea is communicated and like you said, archived. Right. Yeah. And I'm German and Scandinavian. And so it's just locked into me <laughs> very orderly and, um, and a bit too anal at times, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. But there's that freedom. Like I said, that like not everybody as a artistic practitioner feels the freedom to intermix media yeah. and styles and layer. It's, it, it can be frightening for many people to do that, you know? And I think the ease and the freedom that you have with that um, speaks a lot about the journey that you're on in the work that you create, you know? Wow. <laughs> when you said that, I know we have to hurry, but I'll just say one thing really fast. You know, one of, one of my mentors um, is Jeff Walker. He's a Great Falls area artist. And so I had him all during high school and he was so instrumental, so important to me in my work. But I was going to enter, um, I wanted to enter the student competition at the Montana State Fair. And I was just kind of going, geez, what am I gonna do? And he said, if you mix the media, you'll, you'll get a blue ribbon. If you do screen print, intaglio, litho, and put it all together. <laughs> and I did, and I got this best of show for like $100. <laughs> yeah. So, Congratulations. I, I've really been doing that, you know, since I was a senior in high school, I guess. <laughs> Well, there you go. You learned the path to freedom. <laughs> it's fun, really. Yeah. And I think that's something that all three of you have expressed to me is just the joy that you all have when you are in your space, when you also go and venture out in nature and observe and create your work, you know, from what you see or what you touch or what you feel what you smell and just bring that into your work. And I think that um, that aspect of it is really what is strong and pulling everything together as well. And I'm, I'm moving on to this next um, slide here because I think Susan at one point before we were live and we were practicing so that we didn't sound ridiculous <laughs> and we were in front of all of you people. <laughs> Um, Susan had some interesting commentary about continuum. Susan, did you want to talk about that again? Oh, I just, I had asked Deb about uh, the different, how, how she constructs a piece like continuum, uh, which is a, a, a grid of types. Uh, and I see certain 
pieces of imagery that are repeated. And I wondered, I, I use the word stockpile, which is- I love that. More like weapons, but um, <laughs> you know, do, you, do you keep a large selection of these images that you've made over the years, or do you make a new one specifically for say continuum? Um, and then, and, and I mean, I, I think that I needs love to be the one that talk, talks about that. <laughs> yeah, I did like your word stockpile because I do have these like as piles of things all over my studio. But um, as I was saying earlier as well, um, for me, that's one of the attractions of the printmaking process is uh, having the multiple images. So I can, I've got these plates sitting around, I've got copies of these prints sitting around so I can use them, I can reprint them in different ways, I can overprint them, I can do all these fun things with them. Susan was also po posing the question, like do I have, so starting something like the continuum number 11 piece, um, like how formulated in my mind is that, you know, before I'm starting, and I was explaining that I have a pretty good idea of what the piece is about, or maybe even what the piece might be called and what I want to do with the piece. So then I start assembling the images that I want to use um, and just making sure that they, you know, kind of go together, at least in my mind. But I do love all that problem solving, the, the whole aspect of moving pieces around in creating a composition and doing all the problem solving that's involved with, uh, color palettes and, you know, just all of it. And then, um, you know, in the past number of years, uh, I've become really attracted to um, and really interested in the kinds of celestial events that have been occurring because we've had all these like rare, you know, eclipses and complete solar eclipse. And we've had these, all these various, we've had blood moons and blue moons and double super moons. And we've had the most incredible things happening in the sky. And so uh, in the, for the past several years, I've definitely been incorporating uh, various moons and various, you know, celestial events. And I've been really influenced uh, by um, just the things that I'm, learning more about, you know, as comets approach closer and things like that. And, uh, it, and it just, it, it is all part of the whole journey, you know, that we're all on uh, the life and death spectrum and the heavens and the earth and uh, s s contemplations of mortality or what is my place in the world or your place in the world like how do we fit in how do we make sense of the wor world that we're living in and so they're, they're just all things that help me make sense of my world i guess <laughs> from the tiniest bee to the to space to the galaxies right i guess yeah <laughs> yeah so and the and i'll be continuing um you know, of course, a lot of these same ideas and, you know, working with, uh, I'm just basically in my current studio work, just kind of continuing um, some of the same ideas that we've just been talking about in the last few minutes and just finding different ways or maybe some, some uh, you know, slightly different images that still talk about um, species changing and evolving and the life death process and just just all of it. Mm -hmm. So do you think you're I, I'm just saying this because as I I'm, as I look at right here what what people are seeing here in continuum and in a moment in time is this really looking towards um, the heavens you know and how what that all means to us right. for, for example when we look at continuum number 11, yep. where we see, you know, this, the moon, and then we see this heart and we see nests and a bird and how does it all come together, right? What does it all mean after all? So you're gonna continue yeah. on the search. I'm gonna continue my journey. <laughs> yeah. yeah. See? I think that's an excellent um, way to bring it into, um, and here we have this piece here, moment in time exhibited. 
along with a few of your other pieces that evolve around that idea that you've been researching, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I was mentioning earlier, um, you know, I've had a lifelong interest in avian species and the study of birds. And uh, uh, it's just, you know, such a fascinating world. And, you know, some aspects of it are really similar to the pollinators in terms of what's happening with um, some of our bird populations and destruction of habitat and, um, and all the things that are happening in our world to reduce uh, bird populations, but they tell us so much about the health of our environment, which I think is <laughs> such a great indicator. But um, I love looking at birds. I love working with uh, bird imagery. And um, so you will notice if you uh, come to visit the exhibition that tends to be quite a few feathered friends in there. <laughs> And so with that, I think we're going to go ahead and, and move on to Ellen, since we can see that in, on, in, this, in this view of the exhibition, we can see um, your works on the wall, Bev, and we can see below that some of Ellen's pieces that are on exhibit in, in this particular display of the exhibition space. And I think when you were mentioning, Bev, that high idea of that the idea of mortality, the idea of recording, that idea of capturing or understanding, I very well think it ties directly into Ellen's work as well. Um, Absolutely. So yeah. With that, <laughs> we'll, we'll take, we'll, we'll introduce Ellen. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hello, Ellen. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and let you tell them a little bit about yourself. Well, um, I want to start out with something sort of logistical, which is when you see my work and it's got um, this strange number next to it, the reason for that is how to identify all these hundreds of bots and I can't keep coming up with the same kind of names. So PF means primitive fire. 25C is 25 inches circumference by 10.5 inches tall. So it's just, it's a sort of a logistical thing. But it, it's really interesting how Bev and I actually work really similarly. She takes all these uh, various printmaking um, processes so that she can make lots of duplicates. I do the same thing, like you can see my hands in that piece. I took, uh, I am like, if you saw my molds, you go, oh, they're also very primitive. They're one part molds. I just make, make them so that they're press molds. So they're the reverse of the positive. So all I have to do is roll out a slab, press it into the mold and pull it out. And then I have a piece, a piece of clay. Do you and want me like, to go down to that? that section where you can see that mold? In fact, that's a, that's a great example. Those are molds of my hands and it is so easy to, to roll out the clay and place it in there, pull it out. And then just like Bev, I have a stockpile of all of these molds and all of these. The, the trick with clay though, is you gotta keep it wet. Cause if you wanna assemble it, they all have to be wet. Once they dry, they're not gonna stick together. So there's a, it's a tricky um, kind of dance of timing. Right. And so that's, I mean, the process is, is kind of lengthy, but that's the kind of the beginning of the process. Then I've been assembling all of these pieces into another mold of a vessel form. Then when they're dry, they come out of the vessel form. They dry further. I fire them, it's called a bisque firing in a kiln to a pretty low temperature. And then there's just white. And um, that's when the exciting stuff happens, which I was teaching myself how to do this primitive firing. And there's been a lot of <laughs> disasters and despairs and explosions and <laughs> you name it. But um, I got better after a couple of years of doing this. 
I, I really got better at my technique. And so now I kind of know what I'm doing. If you cover up the pot in the garbage can like that with lots of combustibles and starts making lots of black smoke, you're gonna have a really dark pot. The lighter parts of the pot are where they oxidize. So oxygen comes in and it allows the pot, the surface to stay light. And so controlling that is actually really interesting and really tricky. It would take me hours to explain that, but it's probably more <laughs> fun just to look at the work. But these garbage cans have worked great because they put the, the smoke just right where you want it. So, so it's Ellen, a lot of fun. Ellen, thank you for that explanation. Can you tell everybody how you got to this point of creating these vessels? Well, because this is right. not what you've always been making, correct? My I'm going to move up to one of your... Yeah, my background as an undergraduate, which is like thousands of years ago, right, um, was actually at UCLA in printmaking in Taglio when they used to clean the plates with gasoline. Yeah. And you never wore gloves. You never wore masks. <laughs> it was a toxic thing, right? But that was a long time ago. Um, and I was in printmaking. And then I also... This is all in California. I did a lot of painting. I did these uh, oil paintings and they were really dark. Of course they were dark. What else would they be? Um, and then I got into graduate school in, at, at MSU, Montana State University in Bozeman. And I came and I was like 21 years old. And I, wow, Montana was, that was 1973. It was so exciting. It was so exciting to be just in a completely different environment. And there was a grad student there who was doing like wood sculpture and using a router. And I suddenly went, wait a second, stop the painting. And so I started making these wood, wood sculptures. And um, then I had this sort of pivotal moment. I was carving the wood. I'm a very impatient person. It was too slow. That wood carving was too slow. And I had a friend of mine was teaching ceramics at, at the high school in, up in Helena. And she said, well, Helen, why don't you just try clay? It'd be so much faster. And I said, oh, I just hate clay. And she said, well, just give it a try. And I sat there, I was spellbound for hours. I was in her studio. So that's the first thing I ever did. So then I started making clay sculpture and then clay relief sculpture. And then, um, I retired a few years ago and I thought, well, I'm gonna do something that's just something I won't uh, worry so much about the results. I'll just do something fun, right? And so I started making, I had made pots years before. Uh, so I just started making, making these pots using some of the molds I already had. I thought I'd do it for about six months, but it's been really fun. And, and, um, it still has the same influences as my sculptures, which are one of the two primary influences is going through the Southwest and seeing all these ancient sites and the ancient pottery, and then going to Pompeii and Herculaneum and seeing, you know, these like bodies, which I don't know for me isn't grim. I just love like mummies and the dehydrated, the, the, you know, what's that man that was in the bog, the bog man? I mean, I just, I'm fascinated by that stuff. So I try to make these pots look like somebody had just dug them up and maybe they were made out of some bones and some fingers. And so that's what I like to do. So I guess that's a, a quick, you know, a 40 year overview. Oh, Is wow. That, yeah, you, you did a great job, Ellen. <laughs> so, but they're challenging. I mean, making these pots is just like, it's not that easy. It's just like the printmaking or the sculpture, whatever you make. We are, I think all three artists are very concerned with the aesthetics. I mean, we just are. And so it's sort of like, okay, put the pots against the wall so I can put the ugly side in the back. And, you know, and I've been known to smash them because they just, they just didn't work. And then suddenly 
something works and it's like, it's just like this, it's just a, kind of a miracle when it does. So it's, um, I guess what I like about clay that it really is good for me is um, that you can erase it. I mean, like if you have an area and you're working on going, that's not really not working for me. You can kind of cut it out and add another piece on. And so there's a kind of a, to a point there's a fluidity. And then once it dries, you're out of luck. But there is, um, it's, and also clay hasn't gotten so, isn't so rigid as it used to be. And back in the day, everything had to be glazes or under glazes. And now it's like, no, you can paint on this stuff. And so I do, I mean, I've painted, I've, I've used grinders. Um, I used a propane torch if something was too dark. I heat up the pot and, and hit it with a propane torch to get rid of the black to reoxidize it. And then if you do that too much, it, it cracks and it's a goner. So there's a lot of, um, there's kind of a, there's a little bit of an anxiety about it. There's just a little bit like you open the kiln and you kind of hope it's not bad, you know? So there is kind of a, a I think there's an edginess to it. The there's element a, of chance. Well, there, see, I have always been a person with my art. I wanted to control every color, every, you know, I could never get a gl green glaze the way I wanted it. And finally I just said enough and I got my oil paints out. So I always have a vision of what I want it to look like. And so when it doesn't, there's this kind of thing of, oh, can I live with it or can I not? Or can I change it? So there's just a lot of, there's a lot of activity. And Ellen, I think that, uh, you know, you were touching on some of the technical aspects of creating these pieces and they, they are so, um, I mean, I, I love this new body of work that they are so, uh, these pieces are so of the earth and so tactile and so uh, representative of, of uh, organic, you know, material and, uh, and growing living things, uh, just wonderful. Um, but yeah, the t some of the technical aspects, I think both, you know, w w with all of our work, and maybe just with, with visual artists in general is that um, so often people just really have <laughs> no idea uh, what the artist goes through with all of these lonely isolated hours of just <laughs> gr grinding it out and problem solving and redoing and taking out sections and figuring it all out. And because we all love to experiment to some extent, not all of the experiments work out. And um, then we might have to go with plan D. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I think wow. That's what makes it exciting is that if I knew how these are going to come out, I would be really bored. And so it's, it's nice. This is a really good example of see how it's white on the edge there. Yeah. Um, that's where I took the propane torch because it was too dark and to kind of lighten it up a little bit. And the fingers too. It's, pretty interesting but I think I you know I would be really bored if I knew how it was going to come out and I know other artists they work everything out and they know like if they're sculptures they draw it all out to you know to scale or whatever never done that and then they, <laughs> and I did that once and it was for a sculpture and I went oh this is too boring I like I like it when it comes out I like the element of chance and I like being able to fix it if I don't like it. So that's kind of, it makes it all. So I'm never in a place where I'm going like ho-hum. I'm always like, okay, I hope this works. You know, it keeps, it keeps you kind of on your toes. So Ellen, I know that, um, well, just kind of to touch on some of the topics that Bev was discussing in her work, which I see kind of in your work as well is that um, the capturing or the traces of mankind, as you were saying that you're interested in archeology span and um, time gone by. And that like that, when I look at your works, I see the idea of the memento mori, you know? So that, that, that passage of time, that moment of death which is also a record of life. 
you know? It's not, you know, for me, it's not grim for me. And I know that some people have gone, ew, or, you know, it's grim, but I don't, I don't feel that way. And I think, you know, I don't see the grimness in it. I actually find the, quite the beauty in it. And I think that's, that's the, that's what I see in the focus of it, you know, is that the beauty of the moment, you know? Yeah, that's the intent. And you know, when we were all went to college, I'm sure everybody had those still lifes that we all worked on. I'm just thinking about them. And we always had the bones, at least my high school teacher, we were drawing. I was terrible, <laughs> terrible drawer. But we always had the still life with the bones and all those kinds of things. And you know, that was kind of formative about beauty. And so as time has gone on, it has always continued to be um, really beautiful. And so I suppose in my molds, there's some of uh, some of them are deer bones, you know, from obviously I got, I'm living with a with a hunter, so I've got some deer, deer bones, and I have my hands, but I also have some leaves from the yard, and so those are very much alive. So it's a kind of a combination. Like in this piece, you can I guess you can really see it. It's a combination of the leaves and then you know the the hands and then the bones from something that's dead. So it's, and that's, you know, where I live, we, we see that like every day. I mean, we always see that. And, you know, I'm thinking about the circling magpies, you know, something's, something's dead out there when you see them all together like that. They're great animals, they've got lots of spirit. And so there's, a, and you know, like even with your pets, I mean, I just lost one of my birds, you know, and, it's sad, but it's okay. You know, it, it, it's got to be okay. Mm -hmm. Or you're going to just be a mess. You're going to have to, I mean, embracing it is a good thing to do, I think. Right. And that's what I think that is most evident when looking at the works is that kind of transcending beyond um, that tangible part of the work. I think that the, the the earthiness of the work is like one of the primary aspects of it. But I think you have all have this like transcendental feeling to your pieces that move beyond what you see into the spiritual as well. You know, as as far far of the as far as that kind of like that circle of life is how, you know, the rebirth. And I see that as well in your pieces, Ellen. I also yeah. see that that tangibleness, the 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 grit of the earth, the clay, the texture. And you can, when I look at it, I imagine immersing my hands in soil, or in clay, or in you know, and not necessarily something dry, but something potentially wet or gritty. And and even though you're not touching it, this kind of that haptic touch of the eye, you know, just looking at it, you can feel that the grit, you can feel the earth. And not to mention that if you come to the exhibition, there's an ol olfactory element to, to the pieces as well. Good point, I, I hadn't even thought about that, but it's true. When you take those pots out of a you know, cardboard box, it's like you're in a campfire. I mean, you can oh, smell yeah. it, which is kind of, it's kind of okay. Oh yeah, I definitely think it's very nice. It, it, yeah, it adds, it's, it's such a beautiful experience, you know. And the same, same goes through for the boats. Yes. If you get close, you're going to smell that cottonwood, which is so unmistakable, and the willow and all that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're going to see the cottonwood right there. <laughs> We're jumping I'm Trying to find a pick. There we go. <laughs> there we the go. Boats, yeah. Yeah. Wow, these the pieces together. I, I'm just, I'm really uh, so excited about uh, how all of the work uh, interacts with e each other and uh, just how it all flows together. I, yeah. I love it. <laughs> it's wonderful. I I feel like I've had a chance to learn something new about my own work and juxtaposition to with. To, to both of yours. And it was kind of a hope that I had from the beginning because um, I'm pretty used to looking at my work all by itself in my studio. <laughs> and, 
um, aside from, I, I mean, there are interaction, there's certain uh, vessel shapes and so on, nest shapes that are in all of our work, leaves and so on. Uh, but it's something else, and I, I'm still I'm not sure what it is uh, that uh, that I've begun to see. Uh, one thing that when my pieces are hanging the way they are and the shadows they make, I've always thought of them as boats, but the shadows become leaves and bird bodies um, to me, uh, which is fine. Uh, but I hadn't I hadn't been able to see that until. It, it was in relation to your work and and installed in your show. So I'm really excited about that. <laughs> Sorry, Alan, I took took over there. No, it was a perfect segue into yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I I definitely think it was a perfect segue. And I think part of it is is understanding that we're trying to segue into each artist, but at the same time, it's meant to overlap because the works are working together in the space in the same way that we're talking about it. You know, yeah. they are communicating with each other within the space and they're sharing an experience and giving that experience to the viewer. You know, so when, so <laughs> when we're talking about this and we're trying to find that element, I think it's also a very, um, experiential element to it like how you experience the pieces and the work in the space that maybe there isn't quite the word for what that is you know and i don't feel like i need the words for it I, you're right the experience of being in there is, is enough uh, mm -hmm. for each viewer it's going to be a little different exactly and just like you were saying Susan, is like you didn't really imagine or you didn't look at your pieces the way that you see them now with shadows having the, the leaf aspect of falling or dangling until you were in the space with the, with the other works, right? Yes. So yes. much in the same way as like everybody's personal experience when you come into the space. I just, I just for me, I think there is a very, um, universal feeling about um, an understanding of how to come to an understanding of our existence, you know? And that that's the feeling that I get in the space when I see all the work together. So having said that, Susan, do you wanna talk about yourself? <laughs> and Susan, Susan, one of the things I wanted to ask is um, how, how did you initially arrive at or come to the forms that you're working with at this point, which are so lovely? Like kind of what was the development that led you to- uh, this, is, this is my second body of work involving what I call boats. Um, I had done another group in oh, maybe 2007 or 2008. Uh, and then I put it aside, which I have, a, and, and the way I work is I, I'll, I'll work obsessively on certain forms for a couple of years, maybe three years or four even, and then put them aside and do something related, but not the same. Um, I started making most of these when I found out we were doing a show together, which was probably in 2018, I think. Um, and I have to say, I, I, I had to really work hard not to think, okay, how is my, how are the, how's our work going to be together? What, should, you know, what should I have? Uh, but I did a little bit and I just, I also was ready to make the boats again, but I thought knowing what I'd seen of both of your works, I thought this might, this might be a, a real interesting conversation. Yeah. Um, so I went at it this in that way. Um, this particular group, uh, I worked with uh, willow, coyote willow, which grows along the creeks and the uh, Missouri River as well, and lots of cottonwood, which uh, both of these uh, types of wood are so very accessible to me. 
uh, and a little bit of uh, Osher Dogwood. Uh, all of them have different uh, physical qualities. And the boats, when I make a, a piece out of this material and the paper, uh, the boat come, the boat has, the, the materials build the boat. There's, I, I don't like to force any of them, uh, any of the piece, any of the woods. Um, so I have to work and I mean, it's not quite that simple. It has to be a really strong structure. Uh, that's going to hold up. Uh, it needs to visually be appealing to me. It needs not to be too specifically a boat or a leaf or a bird. I really don't want that at all. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, these are so, sort of new directions I went with this group. Uh, also, uh, the previous uh, boat series it, with the papers I use are a mulberry paper that I buy. They're from Asia. Um, I, I, I'm not very interested. I'm not at all interested in making my own paper. Uh, and the previous incarnation of those boats was uh, just the paper and some wax. Uh, this time I had a real need to, to do a little more layering uh, to add some depth uh, to the surface. Um, I've a number of uh, times in my life I've done a fair amount of painting. Uh, I wanted to add paint. I wanted to use cold wax to add a, a little more depth, to add a sheen. Uh, so I experimented with all of that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was very happy with the results. It added a little more variety, a little more depth to the group. Uh, from the beginning, I had in mind that they would be hanging um, in space. Uh, and I, and it, it, I wasn't sure until we actually got in the gallery how that would work. Uh, but it, I, I'm very happy with how it's working. Perfect. Uh, when I was in, when we were finishing up the installation uh, and stepping back, it was very interesting to see with Alan's work, it's so grounded in earth, uh, in both in color, uh, the, it, it's positioned lower in the gallery, uh, it's made of clay. Uh, and then Alan's, to me, was sort of in the treetops. <laughs> <laughs> it, because it's basically about, it's in the middle uh, between the three of ours and uh, my piece is kind of you know, ascend um, into the air uh, but then it circulates back and around and um, I, I just was so happy with how that happened because I don't think any of us intended it to be that way but it is uh, so I'm talking about my work a lot in conjunction with the rest of yours because I mean, that's how I wanted it to be. I, I wanted it to be not just this works over here and this works over here, but that it would be a, a totally interactive experience. And, and I think it is doing that. And I think the other element, Susan, is that, that you can't see here in the pictures is that the, um, the sculptures oh, actually move in space. Yeah. So when you're in the gallery, they are moving. They have a life of their own. They're moving, they are turning, they are creating different shadows. They're interacting with the other pieces in the space. And it's random. It and it just is like, it's turning. Oh, wait, that's not turning anymore. The other one is moving. And it's just the flow of air through the space, you know, that, that, yeah. and, and your work just, you know, is literally taking off on that, like you're saying, that, that um, on the element of air, it's just moving upwards and around the room. Yeah. I think uh, Brad's original question was sort of how did I, come to make these forms and yeah or, or, I don't remember <laughs> I can't remember anymore what inspired me towards this I've made uh, my the vessel image is a continuous part of all the work that I've made as an adult artist 
Uh, and somehow they, they get some, these earlier pieces are more basket-like. Uh, the floating images are, uh, that you see here are made of uh, cane, like the type of material you would cane a chair with. Uh, they came after, after a, a series of, of paintings and drawings that were, uh, they're not exhibited here, but uh, they were vessels and uh, they were very controlled. And I, I wanted to, uh, with the floating images, I sort of wanted to turn the vessel inside out is the, is the best way I can describe it. So I've, I've worked with these tied cane constructions as well. Um, but my, that, that reason, you know, why do I do that? Uh, well, I wanted something different than what I had been working on before, <laughs> but I using uh, the same kind of construction methods with mm -hmm. the tying of fibrous materials together, which suits me uh, for reasons I'm not exactly sure about. I think if I'm not a believer in past lives, but if I were, I, I must have made baskets or something <laughs> for a living. I don't know, from some other time. Mm -hmm. what, um, what I think is interesting with these earlier works is that you definitely have this vessel form. It's holding something. Right, if nothing or something. Holding, it's not holding something specific. Right, um, exactly. It's but also, these are moving. It's also that, open enough to release it. Right, but these are moving. These so are moving, these, and that's these just seem so to exciting. be more static, and these are moving. Yes. You know. Yeah. So maybe there's something there that's telling you, you know. Something is changing. There is movement, and you've been yeah. inspired. Yeah, and this use the color. Um, I was kind of surprised myself at how much color there. Although I knew I was using a, a wide range of colors, um, but that uh, that's uh, not something I had done before. So uh, it it made me very happy <laughs> to, to use all that beautiful color. And I think one time it was interesting when you were talking to me about the work when I went to your studio that that one time before yeah. the COVID, before yeah. COVID, <laughs> a right long while ago. <laughs> and you were showing me all of the different materials bathing. You know, they were all in their baths. Yeah. These these different branches so that they would be malleable for when you were ready to use them. And I just really loved that there was like this element of ritual to your work. There is, um, it's not a really intense element. Well, I don't know. I mean, maybe it is. Um, I really only soak the willow. Um, Cotton wood, it doesn't work to, you have to use that very soon after I collect it. It's a very soft wood and soaking it, it just kind of dissolves into this mush. Um, but the soaking of the willow, I keep just enough of it to make myself think I'm, <laughs> I'm doing a sort of ritual. Uh, traditional basket makers, it's much more <laughs> ritualistic than that. Uh, but I, it's something I like about it. And, and the smell of the wood, the different woods is wonderful. Yeah. And I'm sure there's something to that going out into nature and harvesting. Yeah, and it's, uh, I, the cottonwood is, I, I, I only pick it up off the ground. Uh, there's no necessity. I mean, it's always on the ground in Great Falls because we have so much wind. And it's kind of <laughs> fragile wood. Uh, so there's plenty of it available. I do harvest uh, the osier dogwood and the willow. Um, trying not to take too much <laughs> out of one area. And it's generally either right about this time of year or when the sap starts to flow again, a little later, April maybe, or the fall. And that's when you choose, that's when you go to harvest? Yes. Um, yeah, um, I don't, I don't like to do it when the leaves are out there. Uh, 
and I, I don't want to do it in the winter. They're not flexible in the winter, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. except for cottonwood, which just seems to keep <laughs> giving and bending and uh, all through the season. I find that really interesting how you bring those elements together that you harvest from the trees that are naturally in the air, you know, and then yeah. you're, you're transforming them, you know, you're giving them another life through your yeah, sculpture. I, I don't know if I think about it that way, but yeah, I, I, that's true. Um, I think in all the years I've been out walking and roaming around outside, I've I've always, like many people, I think, have an urge to take some of it home. Uh, and in my case, not just, not, not to have like a rock garden or something, but to, I suppose, transform it, use, use, to, use it to, to make something that, I mean, it, it certainly isn't about trees, <laughs> what I make, it's about right. something else. <laughs> <No. laughs> Well, I don't uh, think there's, it's... There's, there's still a real large amount of mystery to this whole process for me. If there weren't, I don't think I'd keep doing it. Mm -hmm. And I think that what you said is a great statement to end our conversation in the sense that you're all, to me, when, I, when your work is together, it is about understanding the mysteries of the environment that we live in, our life, and then each one of you unique to your to your particular place here in Montana and how you kind of look through the space, through your work to answer questions, to think about the world we live in and, and how it's transforming over time and how in relationship to each other, as you were mentioning your age and your life here in Montana, how that impacts the work you create and the experiences you've had over time. Yes. So I, yes. <laughs> yes, well, well said, Nicole. That, was good. <laughs> that is completely perfect. Well, I, I, I just wanna show this last image, this little panel of the exhibition um, to once again, um, let everybody know that um, the exhibition is a is a destination. So please come. It's not your final destination, but it is a destination. <laughs> <laughs> so come and experience it, and and all the different elements. I I think that um, it's definitely wor well worth the visit. Um, whether you're a connoisseur of the arts or whether you are have never been to a museum to see artwork. It's definitely something you need to come and experience. And with that, I just wanna leave it open to all of you, you to have a final word and say to anything you'd like to say. <laughs> Ellen, uh, Susan. Thank you for making this possible. And thank you to Paris Gibson Square Museum of Art and your entire staff. And we wouldn't be doing any of this if you weren't working so hard. So thank you. Yeah, I, I, I would ditto everything that Ellen said. And it, it was not the easiest installation. Um, and so uh, just uh, the, the result is, is quite remarkable. And uh, also the treat that it has been for me to work with Ellen and Susan. Yeah, thank you everybody for this whole adventure. I'm, I'm just loving it. Well, thank you all of you. And we are so grateful and, and to have you exhibiting at the museum. And we uh, look forward to enjoying it through June. So it closes on June 2nd. Make sure you come to visit and enjoy and we will have We'll see what we can plan until that time. And hopefully we'll have more about convergence for everybody to enjoy and further discussions. So thank you all. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Bev. Thank you, Ellen. And have a good night. Yeah.
<laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Nicole. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye.